Hey everybody, and welcome once again to Nose in the Book, a Bible reading commentary with me, your host, Pastor Justin Van Reed. So great to have you with me these next few minutes as we take a look at four more great chapters from God's Word today. We have uh, 2 Samuel chapter 2, 1 Corinthians 13, Ezekiel chapter 11, and Psalm 50. And each of these is very fascinating in its own right. So let's get uh, right into it here. 2 Samuel chapter 2, it's a big chapter, a lot going on here because we're transitioning now from the, the reign of Saul to the reign of David. Remember, way back in 1 Samuel 16, David has already been anointed by Samuel, the next king over Israel. And so all that had to happen was Saul needed to die, which happened in 1 Samuel chapter 31. So now, after David has uh, mourned, you know, learned of what happened to Saul and mourned over him in chapter 1 of 2 Samuel, now we enter into 2 Samuel 2, and the next thing that happens is David moves from Ziklag back into the towns of Judah to Hebron by the instruction of the Lord, and, uh, and there um, David is uh, anointed again, this time king, actually, you know, now that Saul's out of the way, now he's proclaimed uh, to be king. And um, meanwhile, uh, meanwhile, uh, Abner, and remember Abner, he was the top general uh, that David had called out when he took the spear and the jug from near Saul's head. Uh, he was Saul's top general. And so Abner, he here has already gone to another son of Saul that didn't, wasn't in the battle, didn't die in the battle. Ishbosheth is his name. And he proclaims Ishbosheth as king. Now, David's in the south in Judah, which is the tribe that he's from. Uh, Abner, remember, um, Saul was from the tribe of uh, Benjamin. And so uh, Ishbosheth here by Abner is proclaimed king over all these northern areas Jezreel, Ephraim, Benjamin, all the rest of Israel. And so. Technically, on a purely political level, Ishbosheth becomes the next king of Israel after Saul at the age of 40, we're told. But the people in Judah are loyal to David. So even though the kingdom hasn't split like it will later uh, after the reign of Solomon uh, with Rehoboam and Jeroboam splitting the kingdom, uh, already you, you can see the tension there between the north and the south. And so, uh, so they battle against each other, right? Those loyal to David and those loyal to uh, Abner and Ishbosheth. They come together and they have this little battle. And um, what ultimately ends up happening is um, David has these, these three really top uh, military guys. Uh, and he's related to them. They're um, the three sons of uh, his sister Zeruiah. Their names are Joab, Abishai, and Azahel. And they're in this battle. And uh, Azahel is chasing after Abner. And uh, Abner uh, is keep, you know, he's warning him, you know, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. You better stop. But Azahel doesn't stop. And so Abner does, in fact, kill Azahel. Well, of course, this is going to make Joab and Abishai super angry because now their brother's dead. So they chase after Abner. And I know there's a lot of A names here, right? You got Abishai, you got Azahel, you got uh, Abner. Uh, try not to get too confused here. Abner is with Saul's side. And uh, Abishai, Azahel, and Joab are with David's side. And, uh, and so Joab and Abishai, they chase after Abner. But again, Abner warns them, you know, hey, listen, we've had enough bloodshed for the day, basically. And so Joab and Abishai turn around and Abner and his men uh, retreat. And so we find ultimately here is the report at the end of the chapter. Um, only 19 men are missing or, you know, from, you know, the battle. In addition to Azahel, that's David's loss, and but 360 of Abner's men have been killed, and uh, and so, you know, you might say battle number one goes to David, even though it's very difficult for them because they lost Azahel. All right, moving to First Corinthians chapter 13 here, of course, one of the most famous chapters in all of Scripture, the love chapter, it starts off with this. Uh, you know, beautiful poem about love, but um, actually verses one to three it is really key here. I just, I just think, you know, it gets overlooked a lot because verses four through eight have that poem about love, but 
uh, what Paul says here is basically, if I could do anything, like if I, if I had all the power in the world, right? If I could speak all the languages of the earth, if I could, you know, have the gift of prophecy, if I gave everything I had to the poor, even if I, if I gave my very life, no matter what, if I had it or if I gave it, if I, no matter what, if I don't have love, if I don't love others, then it's nothing. It's worthless. And you know, there's actually a, a fascinating parallel here between this and Psalm 50. I'll come to that in a second. But then, of course, he defines love here, verses 4 through 8. It's a lot different than the world defines love. And you see things here about um, patience, kindness, um, you know, rejoicing with the truth, um, always hopeful, enduring every circumstance. And, you know, Paul goes on to, to explain here how um, you know, the, the, the real big spiritual gifts, prophecy, speaking in tongues, right? These things that were fascinating to people that they chased after. Uh, Paul points out, you know, these things are are limited uh, in their, uh, in the, you know, they're not going to last forever. But this will, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. And it's just a, a, such a, an important teachable thing here for us to remember because, you know, even today, it might not be prophecy and, and tongues and things like that, but we get so caught up in, in, in so many things and, and, and fascinated by so many things and big celebrity things and all of that. What about these three? Faith, hope, and love, and, and, and especially a simple, genuine compassion for others. All right, uh, back to Ezekiel chapter 11. And first half of the chapter is about how God is calling judgment on Israel's leaders uh, in Jerusalem here. And remember, these are the people that are remain, remaining in Jerusalem after initial exile from uh, Babylon. And, um, you know, they're saying, hey, we're safe here. Right? The city hasn't been torn down yet. So we're safe here. And uh, and God says, no, no, you, all, you, you guys have uh, committed some really gross sin here. You're murderers. And so judgment is going to come. You are not safe here. Yes, others are going to be safe. I'm going to uh, protect a remnant here, but not the le these leaders. So judgment's going to fall on them. Then the message comes uh, back to Ezekiel for the exiles, those already in exile in Babylon, and he gives great hope to them to say, um, the people that are currently still back in Israel are saying, those people, the people in exile, are far away from the Lord. So now he's given their land to us, and he says, no, I'm going to restore you, I'm going to gather you, bring you back to the land, and very importantly, I'm going to give a singleness of heart, put a new spirit in you. Right? This new covenant language here, Ezekiel chapter 11. Then, uh, end of the chapter, the glory of the Lord, which has already moved from the, you know, inside the, the temple to the outside to the gate, now proceeds to move from the city and stops above the mountain to the east. So the glory of God is leaving Jerusalem here. And, um, this is the end of uh, of this vision for Ezekiel. All right, last we come to Psalm 50, and uh, this psalm is, um, you know, it starts off to you know declaring the power of God, the Lord, the Mighty One, is God from Mount Zion, the perfection of beauty. God shines in glorious radiance. He is not silent. Right, the power of God here, but also um, the bulk of this here in the middle about how God doesn't need sacrifices. Right now, God instituted the sacrificial system. But he says, you know, you, you keep worshiping me, but I don't, I don't need, I own all of this. I own all these animals. So don't think you know, you're really honoring me by giving me what's all already mine. What I desire, what my heart's desire is, is for you to be thankful, for you to be uh, honest. Um, and, and this is where, you know, I see a relation to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, right? Because you know, instead of the focus being on, you know, all these uh, big 
things, right? He says that I just want you to love. Um, that this is what God really wants, right? He wants our hearts. And just one external worship. He wants our hearts. Now, our hearts that belong to him are going to lead to external worship. But um, but you, you, you got to begins with the heart. It's all about the heart. Uh, and then he ends here, though. The wicked, uh, they need to repent. They need to repent. So God says to the wicked, why are you bothering to recite my decrees, pretending to obey my covenant? You refuse my discipline, treat my words like trash. And, um, and so repent, all of you who forget me, or I will tear you apart and no one will help you. But giving thanks is a sacrifice that truly honors me. Verse 23. So let's be thankful today. What do you have to be thankful for? Lots of things, I'm sure. Uh, why don't you uh, turn those things to praise, turn those things to worship, and not merely you know, rituals or songs or things like that. All right. Uh, thanks for being with me these last few minutes. Hope you enjoyed your time in the Lord's Word in 2 Samuel chapter 2, 1 Corinthians 13, Ezekiel 11, and Psalm 50. Uh, until I see you again, keep your eyes on the Lord and your nose in the book. We'll talk soon.